Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very empowering show coming right up. Our first guest today is Linda Kohanov, and she's here today to share with us her new book, The Five Roles of a Master Herder, a revolutionary model for socially intelligent leadership. Linda adapted her horse-inspired insights into powerful tools for developing collaborative leadership and managing change. Over thousands of years, Linda writes that nomadic herding cultures developed a multifaceted, socially intelligent form of leadership combining the five roles of dominant, leader, sentient, nurturer and companion, and predator. So let's welcome to the show, Linda. Thank you. It is such a pleasure to have you here. My goodness, and what a profound book. Oh, did you get a chance to read some of it? I sure did, and I enjoyed it immensely. I've, I've got to ask Great. you, like, what started you on this path? Well, many years ago, like over 20 years ago, um, I was working in a pretty high-stress business involving radio. I was a radio producer and announcer and program director and also working in the music business as a music critic and organizer of music festivals. Mm -hmm. And the people I was working with were driving me absolutely crazy. And so I bought a horse to get as far away from people as possible on a regular basis just to get renewed. Mm -hmm. And I found out that the things that I was learning from my horse caused me to be more effective with people. And so I wrote a book about it called The Tao of Equus in, that came out in 2001. And since then, I've written five books on what horses and other animals have to teach humans about being better people. It's just so amazing the simple things that we do that end up turning our lives into a whole new trajectory, but making things so much better. Yes. Yeah, it was really, really quite an amazing experience to realize that, well, you know, one of the statistics that came out in the 1990s about human communication was that only 10% of the messages we send back and forth to each other are verbal. And so that even among humans, 90% of the messages we send back and forth to each other are in the nonverbal range. And yet where do we go to learn the intricacies and nuances of nonverbal communication? Horses are experts at teaching this, and um, they really, once you can set boundaries and gain the cooperation of a 1,000-pound being, working with your 200-pound boss or your 150-pound spouse or your 100-pound teenage son or daughter is just not such a big deal anymore. It kind of puts things in, in perspective. Now, when you did the research for this book, How long did that take you? Well, this book is uh, The Five Roles of a Master Herder. is the culmination of, you know, 15 to 20 years of research where when I would write each book, my research would um, cause me to go into places I didn't know existed. And so I would have new understanding about things that would then change my work and change my life. And so when I was researching my fourth book, The Power of the Herd, which is subtitled A Non-Predatory Approach to Social Intelligence, Leadership, and Innovation, Mm -hmm. I actually was researching leadership cultures around the world to try to understand what we can learn from each other. And one of the things that I found was that um, nomadic pastoralists, these are tribes that migrate with large animals like horses and cattle and camels, they actually employ an amazingly socially intelligent form of herd management that also translates to their tribes that allows these interspecies communities to move across vast landscapes. And now more than ever, this is relevant to us because all of the old fences that we've had around ourselves for years in our dominant submission, sedentary culture, these have kind of fallen down. A lot of people travel for business. A lot of people are highly mobile. Um, if they don't like what's happening on the job, they can leave. And they, if they're really upset with how things are going and have some good ideas, they can start a business that becomes competition to the job they just left. And so when I looked at these nomadic pastoralists, 
these people have to deal with predators and changing climates. They have to protect and nurture the group while keeping these massive, gregarious, sometimes aggressive horses and cattle together. And they don't have the benefit of fences and they don't rely on restraint. So they actually have to engage the cooperation of the herd and have the herd and tribe move together with no restraints or fences. And in order to do that, this phenomenon that I call the master herder emerges. A master herder is more than a leader. Um, and a herder isn't just somebody who orders animals around, especially when they're loose animals and they can run off. A herder is somebody who gains the trust of the entire herd. And in order to do this, a master herder has to master five rules of power and social influence. And these roles are the leader, the dominant, the nurturer companion, the sentinel, and the predator. And they have to expertly juggle these skills and in doing so, they can keep large, aggressive animals that sometimes can be flighty together and protect them from threats in the environment. Well, it's easy to see that you are the perfect person to do this research and bring it together where you can identify the leader characteristics in it and be able to equate that to you know, today's leadership abilities and leadership roles because, as you're saying, those are shifting and changing. Yes, and, you know, you really can't get away from leadership abilities um, as you mature in life um, because, you know, if you access your own authentic vision and you want to manifest it in the world, there are leadership elements involved. Unless you're going to move to a desert island and, and just work alone, you actually have to get people to cooperate and sometimes you have to play a leadership role and sometimes you have to use the dominant role or even the predator role. And so... Rather than over-identify with one of these roles, it's helpful to have to think of the human psyche as an ecosystem. We need to keep things in balance. We need to have an emphasis on non-predatory power, but we also need to use the predator role, which is the role that keeps life in balance with available resources. And so sometimes during a tough economic climate, you might have to make some tough decisions. Um, in order to keep the business alive, you might have to cut a few programs that aren't going to be able to thrive once the economy changes. And in order to do that, you can bring forth your inner predator to do it in a naturally balanced way if you know how to use that role well. The predator role can be exceptionally dangerous. And if it's misused, we see a lot of this behavior going on in our culture, which is our culture is a conquest-oriented culture. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is an overuse of the predator role in our culture. And when we hear people say it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there or – you know, using evolution, um, with the theory of evolution as a way of talking about competition for limited resources is a law of nature. Um, and, you know, survival of the fittest means survivalist of the strongest and most fierce. Um, this is actually a misreading of nature. Um, mutual aid is as much or more of a factor in the success of species as competition for limited resources. And competition avoidance is a huge factor in nature. When bears hibernate for the winter, that's competition avoidance behavior. When squirrels store nuts for the winter or when large herbivores migrate, those are competition avoidance behaviors. And so we have to look at, at nature in a more balanced way and we have to take nature in and begin to operate from that balance that nature is showing us. Well, so with understanding, you know, let's say a person is more in the predatory role, can they find balance within themselves to really master all of the five roles and be able to use them as well? Yes. That's um, a, a lot of people don't understand that there's a difference between the dominant role and the predator role. And a lot of people don't understand that there's a difference between the leader role and the dominant role and, and when and how you use each one um, for the good of the herd and the tribe as well as the individual. And a lot of people make the mistake of mixing dominant behavior with predatory behavior. There are a lot of predatory dominant people out there, and they tend to be very dictator-like. They're in, you know, they're in politics and they're in major corporations. And there's a lot of waste and intimidation involved when people – overemphasize those two roles and don't engage the nurturer companion role, um, the sentinel role, 
and and a really good visionary use of the leaderboard. And so once people learn that there are ways to use the dominant role and the leader role in non-predatory form, that really starts to shift things. And then they begin to realize that they can use the predator only for specific purposes, again, keeping life in balance with available resources. But if you have to influence a group and you need to use the dominant role to break up fights between people or deal with adolescent power plays or um, motivate somebody in, in a certain direction when they're wandering off course, those are all appropriate uses of the dominant role. But you have to use them in their non-predatory forms or they become hyper-intimidating and they can actually hurt people and hurt your organization in response. That's such great advice because a lot of organizations, especially when, I mean, you talk about the dog-eat-dog and when they have this kind of mentality, it is highly predatorial and dominant. And so it can be a little rough for people who come in that don't really fall within that category. And one of the, you know, one of the astonishing things is that People who overemphasize any one of the five roles, there's a shadow side to each role that, that becomes toxic to a group. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people, for a lot of people, it's counterintuitive that the nurture companion role can have a shadow side. But when somebody overemphasizes that role, you get a person who engages in a lot of passive aggressive power plays. Um, they, they can be incredibly toxic to a work environment or to a family group when they're lacking the skills in the other world. Um, they, they tend to act out anger and frustration in secretive and, and conniving ways. Um, and if they feel wronged in some way, they don't address the issue directly. They're conflict-averse. They hold grudges, and they undermine people secretly behind their backs. And eventually, they'll pretty much refuse to cooperate or communicate with whoever they perceive to be offensive to them. And this can become a real problem. I mean, simply by giving someone the silent treatment at work, key staff members can make it hard for others to get their jobs done. And so then over time, factions are created and each side feels undermined by the others. I see a lot of toxic nurture companion behavior in social service agencies and spiritual groups. And so um, the, the nurture companion role can also be used in overtly predatory ways. Just think of... You know, somebody who's really um, comes across as, as supportive and reaches out to an elderly person and starts doing their shopping for them and helping them take care of their finances while they're draining their bank account. Mm-hmm. That's a predatory nurturer companion. Or, you know, um, sexual predators are often not, you know, overt, aggressive rapists. A lot of times they use the nurturer companion role to reach out to people who are lonely especially children, and kind of draw them in and groom them for later predatory sexual behavior. So um, the predator role can be used in combination with any of the other roles to create toxic um, and extremely damaging behavior. So if we learn how to use the nurturer companion, the sentinel, the dominant, and the leader roles in their non-predatory forms and only use the predator role, again, for keeping life in balance, then we start to see what it's like to be a well-adjusted, fully empowered, and yet gracious and compassionate person. You know, I I really appreciate that about your book is that in explaining the dominant and non-dominant or, you know, or predatorial and non-predatorial roles and the shadows of it, it allows people to really identify where they're at currently and make those shifts so, so they can get more in balance. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the, you know, for me, I, I tended to overemphasize the leader role, which, it, which is more focused on the future and it's more focused on innovation and, and inspiring others. And I also focused on the nurture companion role. And in my organizations over the years, I would actually abdicate the dominant role and the predator role because I had seen them so profoundly misused. But then I found out that my organization was in incredible danger and we would reach impasses because of my refusal to use the dominant and predator roles in their mature form. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so just as something as simple as a couple of people on my staff being competitive with each other or having some kind of disagreement, 
I would try to lead by example, by being supportive and then inspiring them to look at a new vision of working together. But sometimes you just need to step in and you need to be firm and you need to break up a fight. Because if you don't do that, and you have to use the dominant role to do that, if you don't break up that fight early enough, people say things to each other they can never take back. And factions are created. And then the entire environment gets toxic. And then as a result, you might actually, because of your inability to use the dominant role soon enough, you might have to engage the predator role. And that's what happened to me. The factions were so toxic in this situation that I had to pick somebody and fire that person simply because I didn't intervene soon enough and firm enough. And um, so by refusing to use the dominant role effectively, I had to engage the predator role. And move it that way. And you see that a lot in different, you know, in, in small groups or smaller organizations where there, if there's no clear leader, so someone that's taken that dominant role, then, then it, you know, it kind of is kind of left up where they're trying to decide, you know, who gets to be the top dog of the day, you know? Right. And that is, that is why differentiating between the leader and the dominant is so helpful. Um, the leader in a herd of horses, for instance, is the horse that, that um, others choose to follow. And that, that particular horse tends to be calmer than the average horse and tends to be experienced with different threats and opportunities in the environment. And, um, you know, for instance, when a lion comes into view, horses don't automatically run off. They actually look to the leader horse to see if that horse is panicking or not. And then they might show a little bit of caution, but then they might go back to grazing if the lion has recently eaten a big meal and is just kind of wandering through. I mean, when you look at nature videos on YouTube or pictures on YouTube, you see that large herds of zebras and wildebeest are, are grazing next to lions that are lounging 20 feet away from the herd. And there are several herd members that are acting as sentinels watching the behavior of these lions. And then if something changes, the sentinel members will alert um, other animals, and you'll see a leader come forward and take a look and see if it's a problem or not. And if they run, everybody runs after them. And then the dominant usually comes up from behind, and the dominant has a, a divisive power and a pushing, driving power. And so dominant animals will drive the predator away. But it's a non-predatory form of dominance so that if the dominant stallions are driving the um, – some of those dominant stallions will drive the um, herd away from the lions and others will, will step forward and drive the lions away. Um, and it's non-predatory dominance because these horses don't hunt the lions down and kill them. They just back off when the aggressor backs off. And so non-predatory dominance can hold ground. It can be protective. It can drive predators off. It can drive others away from danger or toward a goal. But it's non-predatory. It does not go for the kill. I love how you use the examples, um, especially with horses, in regards to all of this. And it's such, it, it just is such an enlightening topic in how people can use these principles not only in their work but also in their home life you know anytime they're communicating with other people it's easy for them to go okay where am i at you know after, after they've read your book the five roles of a master herder have look where i'm at and then they can identify where people are coming like the lions in the brush absolutely and the other thing that's really um fascinating and helpful about this model is when i whether i'm presenting this to um, businesses, corporations, medical professionals, um, social workers, counselors, or religious communities, um, what they often tell me is most useful in the beginning about this is that they begin to see the behavior of other people they don't get along with in a new light. Um, rather than seeing a person as being hopelessly defective or you know, really screwed up in some fashion or taking advantage of them, they might realize, oh, this person is overemphasizing the dominant role or this person is overemphasizing the nurturer companion role and, and engaging in passive aggressive behavior. And so it causes you to no longer think of a person as defective, but rather than just think, oh, they're overemphasizing a role that they're really good at 
and they're abdicating other roles that they need right now. And once this person learns how to be balanced, their behavior will become more thoughtful and more compassionate and more empowered simultaneously. Yeah, they're they're able to kind of get out of their own way and see, you know, not not uh, base their opinions of a person on maybe past judgments. They can really kind of look at it for what it is and and not get so emotionally involved. Exactly, and you know, also there there are certain behaviors that, for instance, are very common among people who are naturally good at the dominant role and are still mm-hmm. using it in an immature form. I call these people immature dominance. They can be 75 years old and being immature dominant. It just means they're using the role in a kind of instinctual or unconscious way, and they haven't gained use of the other roles to balance it. But um, whether you're dealing with immature dominant horses or immature dominant people, they have certain behaviors that perplex everybody else that you can just see as a behavior pattern, which you no longer have to take personally anymore. And that Mm -hmm. makes all the difference. So, and a, for and instance, a leader will it, know that, right? <laughs> well, no, not not necessarily. A leader, unless they are familiar with all five roles, will not know that. Mm-hmm. A lot of people who are really good at the leader role are terrible at working with immature dominance and helping these people become mature in their use of that role. A lot of leaders abdicate the dominant role. Um, so a leader doesn't automatically understand what's going on until you really look at her dynamics and the use and the need for all five roles, which nomadic pastoral cultures have known for thousands of years. It's just knowledge we lost when we went to a sedentary, technologically-based culture. And we don't want to get rid of that culture. We just want to combine the social intelligence skills and herd dynamic skills and leadership skills of our nomadic cousins. We want to combine those with the technological advances of living in the culture we've created. And then we'll have the best of both worlds. No, without a doubt. Well, I'm glad that you, you corrected me on that and were able to bring a little bit more light to that part of the discussion because I think a lot of times people do assume that the leader will have control of all aspects. And, it, and it's not until they've actually either have patience or have learned, you know, mastered all these different aspects that they're able to get it. Oh, yeah. A lot of times when people say, you know, we have a failure of leadership here, what they really mean is the, the leaders refusing to use the dominant role, as it turns out. You know, if you have a visionary leader who, let's say, creates an organization to feed all the homeless in Milwaukee, and they, they're, they're, they're focused on the mission and the vision, and they're out in the community making connections, and then behind the scenes what you have are a bunch of people who they've hired, and these people maybe are engaged in power plays or not getting along or are not focused enough on, on the vision. And the, if a leader's addicted to that role, they will often seem aloof and self-absorbed in the mission and ignore all the interpersonal difficulties and nuts and bolts of getting the actual job done. And so behind the scenes, you have somebody saying, we have a failure of leadership here. And what you really have is a failure of a leader to come back around and moderate interpersonal difficulties, get people back on task, and make sure they are engaged with the vision. Well, you know, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, and I'd love for you to share with us. When we talk about emotional intelligence, how is that you know, like an asset to leadership? Well, um, <laughs> um, big question, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's a, it was when I was deciding which angle to speak on. Um, Mm -hmm. UC Berkeley did a study of 85 PhD candidates over a 40-year period, and they were interested in those who had the most professional success, and they found out that high emotional intelligence was four times more important than raw IQ and training, even among PhD candidates. Can you imagine why that would be? I'm I'm not quite sure. Why would that be? Well, you know, if if you're going to be... Um, doing research, let's say, you need to be able to write a grant and you need to go and speak to people who are going to give you money and get them excited about the grant, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you can't just stand up there and, and like a machine just list facts. That doesn't get people excited. Um, you have to show how this is worth um, funding to, you know, the greater culture. And once you get the grant, you actually have to organize people and lead people and get them on track and manage what's going on. 
you know, so the PhD candidates that don't have emotional and social intelligence um, often cannot be professionally successful. Um, they might be able to sign on as a, you know, part of the research team and try to hold themselves up in their office, but they're not going to be the ones who can lead a, lead a team or get a grant. And all of that, you know, translates um, across the board, whether we're dealing with politics or family groups or educational groups or whatever. Yeah, it, it makes perfect sense. And gosh, you know, I wish we had more time to talk about this because it's such a fascinating topic. Not only the approach with animals that you've brought to this and, and the master herder, but there's so much research that you've done with this and there's so much that you know, people today just really need to pick up your book, you know, regardless if they're in politics you know, having kids at home, if they're working with, you know, other like large sales groups or with people, they really, it's a book that they should pick up and start reading to get that basic understanding. And I know we didn't cover all the five roles. We weren't meant to today, but, you know, because we want people to pick up their, their own copy, but it's something that will really prepare people and how to communicate better with other people. Yes, absolutely. And for people who, who love animals and are interested in the human-animal relationship, there's also some unexpected information in the book about how it, it's highly likely that animals like horses reached out to us as much or more as we reached out to them, and that they changed us more, perhaps, than we can even conceive of at this moment. And so, you know, whether you're interested in leadership or getting along better with others or understanding the human-animal relationship, the book has lots to offer. Yes, without a doubt. Well, you know, Linda, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you, Marianne. It's been a pleasure. It's been such a joy. We are going to pause here for a quick break, and we'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient Secrets of Manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com do you know that you can become a genius at any age? Do you know that you can change your life and create a brilliant life for yourself? Hi, I am Olympia LaPointe, an award-winning rocket scientist who you more than likely have seen on TED Talks, Impact Theory, and PBS. Check out my latest book, Answers Unleashed, The Science of Unleashing Your Brain's Power. Simply go to AnswersUnleashed.com books and check it out for yourself. You'll find the tools to help you create the life you've always wanted. The highly acclaimed and newly released book, The Hand Part Two by Lynn Van Prague Grattan, describes the journey between a psychic medium and a family who lost a son. Messages from Beyond Eternity's Gate is of love and healing. For more information, visit www.lynnvanprague-grattan.com. That's www.lynnvanprague-grattan.com.
Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted to be introducing our next guest, Roland Griffith, and he's here today to talk to us about his book, Find Peace, One Pop at a Time. Roland is a successful entrepreneur, public speaker, and business leader who has achieved peace. He's increased his personal hope and joy and has developed a system to help others. Roland also consults with people on how to intentionally turn down the volume on their mental chatter. So let's welcome to the show, Roland. Hey, thank you. How are you, Marianne? Oh, I'm I'm just really delighted we're spending this time together to talk about your book. And you know what? Gosh, who couldn't use a you know a great resource to help them move from anxiety to just a whole different place? Absolutely. It's uh, where, where we all need to be. <laughs> <laughs> without a doubt, without a doubt. Well, and I'm always curious, like, what was the main inspiration for writing this book? Well, I, uh, I had decades of depression and moodiness mounting up th- uh, through my life and uh, through the first, uh, gosh, about 50 years. And, and I mean, it just progressively, I, and uh I had a breakthrough morning in March of 2003, 14 years ago, and um, it changed my life entirely. And uh, and so, um, living on both sides, <laughs> being uh, living in all that agony, I I have uh, so much empathy for anybody that struggles uh, with moodiness or depression and. Uh, so you know, I wanted to heal the world overnight. <laughs> so, so I try. I tried. Uh, you know, uh, speaking uh, little speaking gigs and and uh, some little one-on-one stuff, but it was it was pretty sparse for a while. And and my wife Connie, uh, who witnessed all this and and lived through all this with me, she uh, she kept encouraging me, "Honey, you need to write a book." And so. I could not imagine me writing a book back in oh four oh five, but uh, I got her done, and here we are. And here we are. Well, do you know what? And it's it's such a great resource, and there are so many reports coming up now that talk about like how the millennial generation is the most depressed generation that there ever has been, and and so you look at things like this, and there, you know, we just need more resources for people who are struggling with that. Right, right. I had not even heard that. I mean, uh, but that makes sense to me um, that the millennials are struggling more than any other generation. Um, I can certainly see that. Um, but um, and and gosh, just <laughs> look where where we're at now. I mean, look at the pressure that's on these kids. Uh, uh, kids, I guess they're not necessarily all kids and millennials, but. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't long ago than they were, and um, so the society has just changed. It's such a competitive society. It's all based on achievement and so on, and uh, uh, that can create all kinds of havoc. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it's very courageous of you to share your story, you know, and saying, "Gosh, you know, I had these things going on. I, I suffered with anxiety and depression and what have you, and I was able to move beyond that." And so it gives a roadmap for people who might feel like some, I know when you get in those, those places, it can feel like there's no hope. Exactly. That's, that's the deal. Hope and despair versus joy and peace and so on. It's, uh, um, it's the joy and peace is within all of us. It's available at our fingertips. It's just a matter of understanding some some things that are almost technical about the mind, and um, not technical to where it's hard to understand. It's just that most people haven't had the opportunity to become aware of what the mind does uh, and how how it creates depression and moodiness. And once they can get in touch with that and understand how it works, then they can do something about it. Well, education is definitely the key, and you know, it, having that, having it broken down like that, where people can say, "Gosh, okay, all I need is to educate myself a little bit about this, and there is hope, and there's light at the end of the tunnel, and there's a way out." Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 
So yeah, it, it's a journey, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is, and, and that's the other. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, a, journey, a journey is exactly what it is. It's not, um, you know, people use the word enlightenment. It's not a like a plateau uh, where you jump up to the top of the mountain and everything is rosy. It's um, it's a journey, like you just mentioned. It's a step by step process of gaining more and more awareness of consciousness, more and more aware of. Um, what the mind is doing to you, and how that works. So, yeah, it is a journey. So, uh, yeah. good point. Well, and, you know, I know in your book you talk about how, like, negative metal, you know, negative chatter that almost all of us have can lead to depression. Why don't you share with us a little bit about that? Yeah, great. Uh, um, I'll give you my little my little take on how... The mind works. Um, so I stop and think of a TV remote. And most of them, if you look at them face on, they've got a little arrow points to the left, uh, an arrow that points to the right, and maybe a circle in the middle. And so if you think of that as being time, we live in time, the arrow to the left, if we... Uh, I use this analogy that that represents past, and the one that points to the right represents future. Well, what goes on day to day for most of us, if we pay attention, our mind is either in the past or the future. Very, very little time is spent in the present where peace lies. And so it's a matter of figuring out how we can be in peace more And uh, so it goes like this. To me, the stories that we listen to, uh, whether it is about the past or about the future, um, the longer we listen to them, the longer span of awareness we are in, the more dramatic it gets. Mm -hmm. So as we feed that by just listening and paying attention to it and honoring it, um, it... It takes us down. It creates emotion. And if it's about the past, stories about the past, it will create regret, um, sorrow, anger, remorse. If it's uh, stories about the future, it can cause emotions such as fear, Mm -hmm. anxiety, stress, and so on. Either way, it, it's it's painful to endure, and and uh, that's what most of us go through on a day-to-day basis. Now they might not cause severe agony, agony, but it might um, cause discouragement, and um, and um, hopelessness, and so on. And uh, so um, the key. As far as I'm concerned, and what I kind of developed is this POPs system that teaches a person um, how they can just uh, intentionally, momentarily stop that mind chatter just for a couple seconds. And that, that shortens up those stories, and the stories aren't as painful. And so it kind of, as time goes on, Instead of living through mountains of drama on a day-to-day basis, it gets it down to speed bumps of drama, um, to where you know you don't you don't experience near as much emotion. You're much more productive. You're much more energized. You're much more sociable, and all those things. So I have in my book a list of what I call POPs, which a P-O-P stands for a piece of peace, a P-I-E-C-E of peace, P-E-A-C-E. And um, I'm just going to read you a couple right out of my book. Um, If you envision your heart inside your body at this very moment, imagine it as a red, vibrant organ, its valves opening and closing in the aliveness of its operation. So what I'm saying is envision that heart inside you pumping away. Just envision it for a couple seconds. At that very time, 
you are not in <laughs> you are not in agony. You, you, your mind is not working. Okay, so you've stopped it for a couple of seconds. Or envision your lungs working inside your body as you breathe in and out. Picture your lungs inflating and deflating. Or stop and look at a tree. Admire its shape and, and beauty. Observe a flower or the blue sky. Or listen to a bird's song. Anything that pleases your eyes or ears. Nature is an excellent source of pops. Um, any, nature. Uh, watch a dog or a cat. They can be a refreshing way to temporarily break free of thoughts. Just gaze into their eyes and note their subtle movements. So, Mary Ann, those are a few types of pops. I list a number of them, and there are uh, considerably more than those that um, that I that I offer to um, for people to learn uh, to incorporate in their day to day life. Well, it really brings. I love how you have not just the acronym for POPs, but the whole action of it, where it allows people to take a break, and it's in that in, it's that break of that repetitive thought that allows people to then move forward and just kind of reset things. You know, otherwise right. it just keeps going and going and going and going. So when we have that break, like you're talking about, you know, it, it's a it's an opportunity for a reset to take place. Right. For those that have, that actually read my book and actually um, take this on as a, a little project, which, by the way, I say takes about as much effort as brushing your teeth one more time a day. It's, there's not much to it once you read uh, the step-by-step procedure as to how to get on track with this. Most people that actually give this a, a real shot in two, three weeks have such experiences as just momentary experiences where they will observe that beautiful tree in their front yard that they hadn't even noticed before. Or they'll hear the birds singing on that same trail they've been walking and uh, not heard before. Or or they'll notice the blue sky. And so it's just that's how it works is, is you start opening up consciousness, little pockets of consciousness that you weren't experiencing before. And so as time goes on, um, I have a little daily log, and I'm not going to get on it, into it too much on the radio because it seems complicated, but it's spelled out best in the book. But once you follow this little daily log that kind of keeps you motivated in that direction, it's absolutely amazing as to how a person can make a transformation, not from zero to 100, but just a little bit more as you go. And once you start heading that direction, you never want to go back. There's just and, and uh, so it it's a great way of life. Well, and it sounds like with your book, it it's giving people the tools to identify the negative feelings, so they can start doing something about it. Right. Mm-hmm. I tried to keep it short and sweet. It only takes about an hour to hour and a half to read the book. So, um, um, in a way, it's pretty much to the point. The book starts out telling my life life story, and that's a, the, a short part of it, maybe about the first quarter of the book, and then it's more about the self-help uh, uh, rest of it to uh, try to help people. Mm-hmm. Moving forward. So when you were writing this book, was there something that kind of just surprised you as you were going along your journey, maybe how simple some of this is or... Was there anything that surprised you along this path? Um, well, I can say, you know, like like most people that try something new, you know, I would I would have discouragement from time to time. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, that lessened more and more as I went forward. It's like anything. It's like taking up the game of golf. I play golf. I have for years and years. And and um, so, you know how it is. I don't know if you play golf, Marianne, but um, starting that game out. I stay away from that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, but starting out playing the game of golf can seem pretty difficult. And and you're, you're into all kinds of thoughts and mechanical stuff and so on. But the more you play, you just and you just eventually just play more than you do all that 
thinking of mechanical stuff. And the same thing kind of applies on my little system here. Mm-hmm. It becomes more natural. You don't I, today. I, I don't do pops. I don't. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I, I probably do subconsciously, but um, it just becomes kind of an automatic thing. You just you you, you you come to a point where you you say you can almost feel it. You say, "Oh, oh there I go again. I'm drifting off." You know, like driving down the road. To, drifting off of my lane you know it's just uh, you can kind of become very sensitive to when you're drifting off into thought which is generally speaking not very productive yeah well and that's that's good that all these things are identified and i know you also have eight steps to finding pieces of pop and we've kind of gone over like kind of one of them why why don't you share with us one that you really would you know really enjoy well, um, let's see here. Um, well, okay, let me <laughs> let me go into my golf ball theory for a second. Um, my uh, I mentioned in in, uh, in my book where uh, when I was still depressed, I was gaining weight, and I've always been a fairly slender guy, but. Um, um, I was gaining weight to the point that uh, my trousers were, were getting pretty tight, and I was using rubber bands and paper clips and sweaters over and everything else trying to stay in that, that size I was in, and I just couldn't imagine changing my whole wardrobe to go up. And, and so I, it came to be panic time for me. I really needed to do something about it because I, I would I always weigh in every so often, and it would be, I'd be up a couple pounds, and then I'd be down a pound and up three pounds, and it was just so discouraging, and I just could never seem to get a real handle on it. And so going back playing golf all my life, uh, I come to find out that uh, what can really weigh your golf golf bag down is carrying excess golf balls. It's really easy to do that. You pick up a ball that's in the rough that nobody's playing or it's one that you no longer actually use. You've got a scuff in it and you throw it in your bag and so on. And so that adds some some weight. And uh so, goofy me, one time I Googled the weight of a golf ball. It's 1.6 ounces, exactly one-tenth of a pound. And so I thought, if I can develop a weigh-in system on my weight just based on the average rather than what today was or yesterday was, and I can break that down to one-tenth of a pound, it's going to be yeah, – I found out it was really easy to start losing weight one-tenth of a pound. And uh, so I lost 20 pounds in, um, in a matter of like, uh, I don't know what it was, eight or nine months, I think. And uh, I was able to stay in those trousers, and, and I still am. And I, I got up to then the 190s, and now I'm about 170, what I got back down to. So, um, but, so that concept of small, tiny steps, I applied to the system that's in my book. And so there's a kind of a similar to a weigh-in. There's a, there's a part of this deal is you ask yourself at the end of the day, what percent of time do I think I was in the present? And you add that to the log in, and then there's an averaging system, and you break it down to gaining one-tenth of a percent in increments. And it's amazing how that keeps you motivated because you can watch yourself climbing that, that progress, and, uh, and uh, so it's all a part of it. So. Yeah, that's, that's my that's my golf ball theory. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good theory there. You know, well, let's say someone um, comes to you and they're they're saying, "Gosh, you know, I'm I'm you know starting on you know my pop program and I'm you know doing the eight steps, but I still feel myself getting stuck sometimes." What advice would you give them? I tell you what, I'd go right back to the book. Um, I'd go in the earlier, the earlier parts of the book where it talks about um, in, what we've already talked about. Basically, that okay. For instance, uh, you can always say to yourself, "I am here, but my mind is there." I am here, but my mind is there, and in focus and to, to just recognize that that's what's going on. That's why I'm discouraged. My mind was going negative on me. And um, 
It's mm-hmm. talking about the future. It's saying I can't do it any longer, or it's a, you know, it's a crazy deal. It just doesn't make sense, or it did at one time, but it doesn't now, and so on. That's mm-hmm. the mind working. Mm-hmm. So it's a matter of refocusing like that. And sometimes it may take a little while in that refocusing, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. It's it, absolutely. It's a matter of it's, it's something new um, that most people haven't experienced. Most people are just if you if you walk in a park and people are walking by you, I can pretty much guarantee you most of them are just into their mind. They're walking. They're not paying any attention to what's around them. They're they're thinking and. Um, I mean, go, gosh, go to Manhattan, walk, walk the streets of New York. <laughs> There's <laughs> floods of them. And that's what's going on with, with most people. And, uh, and most of them are having struggles from one to another, problems in life. And all those problems are magnified in the mind. I like to call the mind the dramatizer because that's really what it does. Yeah. It, it just kind of likes to take things and wrap them into a story that hasn't happened yet, but sometimes it can be pretty negative. Sure. We need the mind. It's all part of us, the miraculous creatures that we are, but but <laughs> there's a there's time and a place for it, and there's a, there's a good purpose for it. It's how we create things. It's how we plan things and so on. It's how we socialize. We use it for so many things, but we just have to recognize that that we there's a certain limits to how much we want it to take over us. Yeah, and and you know, and once we realize that maybe our mind's going down a path we really don't want it to go down, you know, there's hope. You can you can also you can always kind of stop and then make that choice to you know move forward in a different way. Exactly. You're on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got such great, your book is such an inspiration, and I know it's going to help a lot of people because there's so many people that do, you know, they quietly suffer with anxiety and depression, and it's tough, you know. they uh, Everyone needs a hand up every once in a while. Yeah, it's it's everywhere. I mean, it's you go up and down your street, and look, you know, probably just about someone in about every house household has it, struggles to some degree or another. And um, so, I, I it's kind of sad in the uh, mental health industry. There's this stigma and there's this terminology of mental illness and so on. But to me, mental illness is. I mean, if you have a little bit of that going on, it means you're normal. <laughs> it's yeah. it's a. Uh, what so many you know we all we all have struggles to some degree or not it's a matter of learning how to minimize that as much as possible and to work your way out of whatever is going on because i mean i think i think you're right i mean in the past there's been such a huge stigma uh, about mental illness or any type of you know depression anxiety anything like that but it seems that there's also a shift and books like yours find peace help people to really understand truly what's going on yes and if i can uh, let me throw in something here that i I don't always mention i'd like to mention just for a second here and the importance of recognizing the first thing in the morning that you know when we go to bed we're in the dreamy state Mm -hmm. and uh, that's what needs to be we fall asleep when we wake up we're still somewhat in the dreamy state and, boy, the mind is really going first thing in the morning. And if you start out the day listening to that mind, um, you're liable to start out having a bad day. And so that's an important element to consider is what do you do first thing in the morning? Um, if you need to jump in the shower first thing, I highly recommend it. If you need to jump up to that coffee pot right away, I highly recommend it. Anything you can, but... Uh, but don't sit around uh, carrying those stories on that you woke up with. They can kill your day. Yeah, yeah, because you really want to start off on a fresh foot. So um, those are great tips. So either take a shower, you know, do something that kind of just motivates you and gets you out. What are some other things you would suggest for our listeners? Well, I'll tell you, I like turning on energetic music in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I'm an old guy. I like some of the old Motown stuff. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that gets me jumping and jiving in the morning. You know, I like that. So, uh, but uh, um, just... Uh, just become aware of it. Just become aware of that. Uh oh, there it goes. And um, watch that. You know, there's a lot of ways you can approach uh, and visualize your mind working. For instance, uh, I'm an old Iowa State Cyclone fan, and so I know what a cyclone looks like. And so if you envision that mind spinning up above your head, you know, if you can get to the point where you can observe that, it goes away, it just dissipates. Uh, and uh, so you're not fighting it. You're just becoming aware of it. And when you become aware that you're, oh, there goes my mind again, then it slows down and it stops. So, um, and, and to absolutely come to a place, and this takes a little bit of work for, for some people to recognize that mind is not who you are. It has nothing to do with who you are. It is nothing. It, it's, a, it's a mechanical thing that's working. Uh, that's creating these thoughts, and it can certainly affect you. And if you can separate that from who you are, because who you really are is a human being. You're always being. But the images that the mind is throwing out there are nothing but images. Mm-hmm. So uh, It's all kind of based on, you know, our past experiences, programming, or what's going on with us mentally. Yes, right. Uh, such a, I think it's so good to have these discussions and bring more awareness to this topic. What final thoughts do, would you like to leave our listeners with today? Well, I, I think it's so important to recognize, first of all, if you're having struggles, you are normal. Mm-hmm. And, um, and if you are... Um, um, if you are out of hope, um, sit down, write yourself, uh, sit down and do a little journaling. Mm-hmm. Write down what's bugging you. I, I call it W-B-Y, what's bugging you. And just write yourself a, a one sentence, what's bugging you. Write it out. And then, then after that, one sentence, then say why. And, and then write it out, another sentence, and then why. And then another sentence, and then why? And so if you've got big issues, that may get right to the bottom for you. Mm-hmm. So that's a good help. But I certainly offer to incorporate my POPs method as a daily routine. But if you get really snagged, that's something I recommend you do. Get out a legal pad or something and just write that out. W-B-Y, what's bugging you? And talk to yourself and answer that and then why. Answer that and why. You know, usually get to the bottom. Those are great places to start because then you can have that inner dialogue and decide, okay, what's this thing that's bugging me, and then, and then what do you do? Well, you'll see the light. Mm-hmm. When you get to the bottom of it, you'll see the And whatever you get some reality comes in you know what I mean you get some relief and uh, it's, a, it's a good little trick well it sounds like it's a great tip for people to use to kind of make that shift and to start really having that dialogue about what they're thinking and what they're feeling so Griff where can people connect with you and learn more about the book and all the great things that you're doing my website is uh, Roland Griffith dot com that's r o l a n d g r i f f i t h dot com and uh, on there um, you can read about uh, me and what I have going you can read about uh, my book um, it can take you right to the Amazon page you could also just go straight to Amazon and look up uh, my book titled Find Peace One Pop at a Time. Mm-hmm. Um, so either direction there you can uh, you can learn. And they can learn more about you and, and all that great stuff. And, of course, like what I've done, connect with you on social media so that they can just stay in touch with all the information that you're posting and 
um, and sharing with your community. You know, Griff, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Hey, Marianne, I enjoyed it a lot. I appreciate you allowing me to be your guest. (laughs) <laughs> it has been a pleasure, and again, gosh, what a great topic, a fabulous book. Highly recommend it, Find Peace, available online, and um, of course you want to visit Griff's website to find out more about all of his great information. And that website is rollandgriffith.com. We're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for taking the time to tune in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.